Ronin opened his eyes, slightly reluctantly, mainly because his dreams had been about Varisa and his soon-to-be-born twins, but also mainly because he didn't particularly want to go through more silly sprite nonsense, because that was stupid. Warcraft lore should be deadly serious. But instead of a bunch of little sprite dickheads, the first thing Ronin saw was Krasis, which still kind of pissed him off anyway, because as far as he was concerned, this was all Krasis' fault. Slowly, Ronin. You've slept more than a day. Your body needs a minute or two to join you in waking. Ronin tried to rise, and indeed, felt his body scream from stiffness. Where... where are we? We're guests of the Forest Lord. This is his realm. We're not in any danger, Ronin. But I must tell you immediately that we're unable to depart. Great. What happens if we try to leave? Grace has then pointed at a bunch of flowers. They'll stop us. What? The plants? Trust me on this one, Ronin. Fucking try it, you bitch. Warcraft lore should be deadly serious. Ronin's stomach then growled loudly. Our host should be here shortly with sustenance. He no doubt already knows that you're now awake. Who is he? His name is Cenarius. Do you recall it? Ah, uh, rings a bell. Some kind of forest deity, isn't he? A demigod, to be exact. Which still makes him a force that even my kind respect. Right. Cenarius. You speak of me, and I am here. I bid you welcome, one called Ronin. A ten-foot man moose then approached, and Ronin just kind of stared in awe. He slept long, young one. Here, I've brought some food for you. Cenarius then handed over a bowl, the contents of which somewhat surprised Ronin. He expected a bowl of fruit, or lettuce, but this was a big old thick piece of meat. Ah, uh, I have a question. Time for questions will be coming. For now, I'd be remiss if you did not eat. Krasis nudged Ronin and started to eat some of the food. So, the wizard went ahead and tucked in himself. However, he still felt a little bit unsure about the meat. It's not that he didn't want it. He was just a bit surprised that a forest god would sacrifice an animal for two strangers. And Cenarius must have noticed the wizard's hesitance. Each animal, each being, serves many purposes, including the necessity of food. You are like the bear or the wolf, both of whom hunt freely in my domain. Nothing is wasted here. Everything returns to feed new growth. The deer upon which you now feed will be reborn to serve its role again, its sacrifice forgotten. Ronin frowned, not completely following Cenarius' explanation. Fucking try it, you bitch. The conversation then paused, whilst Krasis and Ronin had their fill, until eventually... I've conversed with the others, discussed you at length, and we all agree that the two of you are not meant to be here. You're out of place. But in what way, we've yet to determine. Perhaps I could explain. Ronin agreed. It probably was best if Krasis was the one to explain the situation. We come from a land across the sea. Far across. But, um, that's unimportant. What is significant is the reason we ended here. Despite choosing to stay silent, Ronin was surprised to hear his former mentor blurt out a rather altered version of events. We were journeying among some peaks in the bitter north of our land when we came across an anomaly. The wrongness of it struck us both, so we tried to investigate it further. But it moved and enveloped us. We were cast out of our land and into the domain of the Night Elves. Yes. No mention of Nosdormu, no mention of time travel, and no mention of Krasis' true origins, i.e. the fact he's actually a dragon. This bears immediate discussion with the others. Your needs will be dealt with during my absence, and then we shall speak again. And with that, Cenarius buggered off. What was that? Why didn't you tell him about your- Krasis shot Ronin a sharp glare, as if to say shut up. I'm a dragon without strength, my young friend. No matter who Cenarius is, that needs to remain secret until I understand why I cannot recover. Okay, and the rest of the story? <sighs> Ronin, I mentioned to you that we might be in the past. Yeah? Cenarius and I spoke during your induced slumber. I know now when we are. That's great. Gives us an anchor of sorts. Now we can determine who best to... Let me finish, Ronin. There is a very good reason why I altered our story as much as I could. I suspect there is much that Cenarius already knew, especially about the anomaly. 
What I could not tell him are my suspicions of what happens next. I fear we've arrived just prior to the first coming of the Burning Legion. That was about the most horrifying thing that Crisis could possibly say, as far as Ronin was concerned. We've got to tell him then. Tell everyone we can. They must not know, Ronin. It may already be too late to preserve matters as they once were. The Legion were defeated, but only after a terrible bloody war. By coming here, by simply being here, we may have altered that history. We may now be responsible for the Burning Legion becoming the victor in this first struggle, which would not only lead to countless innocent slaughter, but the complete erasure of our time. Meanwhile, most likely due to the fact Tyrande had made an impassioned plea rather than anything Malfurion had said, Illidan was now in on the very rash plan. I'll deal with the sentries. No, I said I'd take care of them. Give me a moment. Malfurion then closed his eyes, calmed himself as Cenarius had shown him, and then made a polite suggestion to the necessary elements of nature. And sure enough, a tender wind started to blow, carrying with it the scent of flowers and the soothing calls of a bird. That seductive combination enveloped the nearby sentry's standing guard, and then they all passed out. It worked. Nice trick, brother. But for how long? I don't know. That's why we must hurry. Duranda moved first, kneeling down beside the cage. I think Broxigal was caught in the spell too, Malfurion. Sure enough, the big old lump of an orc was completely unconscious. <sighs> Rouse him softly, Duranda. Be sure he sees you immediately so you can signal for silence. He's sure to yell. The spell on the guards will hold, Illidan. Just be ready to do your part when the time comes. I'm not the one who'll risk us, brother. Quiet, both of you. Duranda then reached into the cage and gently touched Broxigar's upper arm, whilst softly calling his name. No, <laughs> no. Brox's eyes widened, but, processing what was happening very quickly, he then clamped his mouth shut and nodded. Now, Illidan, hurry. Illidan then got to work, muttering under his breath whilst grabbing the bars of the cage, and then... You can open the cell now, Taranda. So, Taranda touched the door of the cage, and it immediately swung open. The chains, Illidan. Of course, brother. I've not forgotten. Again, Illidan muttered some words, and this time grabbed the chain shackling the orc, and after a few seconds, the chain snapped open. No trouble whatsoever. Proxigar then stiffly rose to his feet and exited the cage, very cautiously nodding his gratitude to the night elf that had assaulted him only a few chapters ago. Proxigar, listen carefully. I want you to go with Malfurion. It will take you to a safe place. I'll join you later. That part of the plan had been Malfurion's idea, which Taranda had somewhat argued with. But, to be fair, once the Moon Guard discovered the Broxigar is no longer in his cell, the young priestess was likely to be a primary suspect. Brox then studied Malfurion for a moment, before glaring at Illidan. I just saved your hide, beast. Enough, Illidan. Just Malfurion. He'll take you to a place where no one will be able to find you. Please, trust me. I do trust you, Shaman. One of the guards on the floor then twitched. It's starting to wear off. Illidan, take Tyrande and leave. Brox, come on. And then the group split up, with Tyrande and Illidan heading towards his quarters, whilst Malfurion and Brox attempted to escape the city entirely. However, they only made it a few streets away before a sound that Malfurion had feared most arose. This way! I've mounts waiting for us! We ride these! Of course! Come on! Brox didn't look overjoyed about climbing on the back of a big panther, but it's not like they had much choice. So he took a deep breath, did as he was told, and the two buggered off. Meanwhile again, Captain Varathen had very little desire to face Lord Xavius after what had happened, but he kind of had to. However, that concern completely vanished as he entered the highborn chamber and witnessed some kind of nightmarish beast. By a loon! His name is Hakar. Those fell beasts are entirely under his control. The Great One sent him to help us. The Great One, my lord. It's all right, my good captain. Nothing to fear. My lord Xavius, the captives were lost. The forest turned against us. To Varathen's surprise, the Lord Counselor simply smiled. You will be given the opportunity to redeem yourself in good time, Captain. First, you must understand the glorious truth. My Lord, I don't- Varathen didn't get to finish that sentence, because a sudden overwhelming sense of a god hit him. 
You too will serve me well. He will be coming to us soon, Captain. He sent this noble guardian to open the path for others of his host. Others who will in turn help us strengthen the Vortex and bring about the fruition of all of our dreams. My lord, my failure to capture those strangers. Your failure is moot. They will be taken. The Great One is most interested in this matter. The car then cracked his whip at an empty area near him, and out of nowhere, a fell beast appeared. He then cracked his whip again, and another fell beast appeared. Ah, oh, I get it. He's got one of them fell beast whips, yeah. They know what they seek, and they will find them. Now, we shall begin our own task. <laughs>